Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the, in the hand of God, the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for this morning is a portion of Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10, found in your bulletin insert, or in your bulletin. 
We will read responsibly by whole verse. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. Save both man and beast, O Lord. How priceless is your love, O God! Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. For with you is the well of life, and in your light we see light. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your favor to those who are true of heart. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were, led, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward had tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There's more at work in this world than meets the eye. Cultivate a holy expectancy that sees God's hand at work even in the most unexpected. In the Gospel lesson from John, John is not wasting any time. The gun has sounded, and we are off to the races. Christmas has given way to epiphany. In chapter 1, the word becomes flesh. It's born among us. It drafts its disciples. It sees Nathaniel under the fig tree, and then boom, here we are. John chapter 2, flying by, it feels like, into this first public revealing or manifestation of Jesus' glory which is why this miracle gets such a prominent place in the lessons of the season of Epiphany, which is the season of revealing and manifestation. This passage, from a narratival perspective, is actually quite curious to me. I don't know if you catch this, but the dialogue feels just slightly, strangely non sequitur. For example, Mary comes up to Jesus to say, they have no wine. Now, this could mean an informative statement simply, or it could just simply be a comment on the current state of wine as given the most recent report from the servants. But Jesus certainly takes it as a solicitation to work some magic, which he definitively declines. But when Jesus, when Jesus says that, Mary's very next line is to suggest that Jesus is on board, ready to go. She turns to the servants and is like, hey, let's get this done. We're ready to go. It's like they've had this strange conversation that to the distant reporter looks as though they're talking past one another, and yet they walk away with perfect understanding. 
It's kind of fun to read this passage, imagining them talking with shared irony, with a kind of knowing glimmer in the eye. Mary certainly seems to be in charge. She's the protagonist of the passage. It opens with, Mary was at a wedding, and oh yeah, this guy Jesus happened to be there too. Mary gives the servants permission to listen to Jesus, and Mary must have allowed Jesus to see something, perhaps in that moment that he wasn't able to see, because Jesus says in verse 4, my hour has not yet come, but then in verse 11, it says that Jesus revealed his glory, as we, of course, know how the story goes. Jesus' hour to depart from the world will come, but no one is asking that of him now. Instead, one sees in the scheme of divine timing an inexorable train of events that goes from him revealing his identity to his identity being rejected. Indeed, life itself being rejected. It's as if Jesus, in knowing what is before him, sees the horizon of the choice that he is to reveal who he is, and that coming from that will be his sure and certain death. It's the domino effect of the gospel story. The creator of the world's unaccepted, unacceptance by the self-same world that was created. We have here in this sign at the wedding of Cana, in this glorious occasion, we have here the first domino of Jesus' downfall. My time has not yet come, and yet the countdown is initiated. The sign which he is making here extracts a heavy toll from our Savior as the end already seems to be in sight. It's a sign, but a sign is a revelation of power. It's a confirmation of identity. It's an elicitation of faith. Interestingly, in a quick tour through John's gospel, how many times instead of the word sign do you see the word miracle? Well, precisely zero. These signs are miraculous feats to be sure, but they are not named by John as such. They are signs, and as such, their primary responsibility is to point to Jesus's identity and inspire faith. And so that's why we see in the final line of our gospel passage from this morning, it says precisely that. Glory was revealed and the disciples believed. The sign was a success. Yes, it, it was to his disciples, but what about to the others? What about to, what about to everybody else at the wedding? That's a question I've been chewing on over the last week. The whole wedding party is not exactly lifting Jesus up on their shoulders, proclaiming him winemaker and the life of the party. Incidentally, for Jesus' um, dedicating himself to ministry, he might have had many, many more wedding invitations if he had revealed his glory a little too much, if you know what I mean. And yet the fact remains that Jesus was at the wedding and it doesn't seem to be on the top of his mind. It's hard to tell exactly what's happening, but we do know that the direct beneficiary of Jesus' miracle is the unnamed bridegroom. He gets the credit for the honorable act of saving the good wine. So what's interesting to me is that from the perspective of the people in attendance at the wedding, God's miracles are others' generosity. God's mighty works are others' hospitality. There's no reason to think that anyone outside the inner circle of disciples and servants left that wedding thinking anything other than Dang, that bride and groom threw a killer party. And, yet, and so it is, then and now, how are you to ever know? How are you to ever know it in the good times, uh, in, in the lucky times, in the fun times, even though it may, be, it may seem to be due to one thing, that it's not actually ultimately due to God? 
God sublimates his mighty works through anonymity so often, doesn't he? God does not need to receive the credit. And yet the eyes of faith are constantly on a seek and find mission of God's signs in the world. There are two enormously important practical consequences of this reality. One, you are always a potential beneficiary of God's anonymous works. And two, you are always a potential semiconductor of God's anonymous works. But it takes the eyes of faith to spot it. It takes, the, it takes that kind of faithful vision to see that there's more at work, even when it's unclear or anonymous. The Birmingham campaign began in April 1963. It wasn't until the following month that Eugene Bull Connor would authorize the use of high pressure water hoses and police attack dogs on protesters, including children and adult bystanders. It wasn't until over 2,500 people had been arrested in violation of parading that Connor would transform the stockade at the state fairgrounds into a makeshift jail to hold more people. And it wasn't until 10 or so days into the campaign that Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested and imprisoned in the Birmingham jail. And it wasn't until that same day, upon King's arrest, that a group of eight ministers wrote the call for unity, an open letter by eight white men who took issue with the campaign being led by an outsider and they wrote in the letter to encourage King to stop protesting. One of the authors of this letter was C.C.J. Carpenter, our very own Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Alabama. At this moment, <laughs> at this moment when you are sitting in jail and you, a pastor, have been turned on by other pastors at this moment, what was King to see with the eyes of faith from his point of view in the jail cell? From where in such times do you gather the strength to spot the signs? It was on that newspaper where the pastors wrote their criticism. It was in the margins of that same paper that he began to write and craft a letter from the Birmingham jail with the words, right defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. But he was in jail. No matter, fill the jails was the motto of the day. Too many people in jail, keep them coming. Swell them up and break them from the inside out. Get out of jail free? No, 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 there isn't freedom outside, so go into the jails to find it. One has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And in times when it is not clear, in times of trial, in times of joy, are we to see with the eyes of faith? God brings joy out of the old vessels of the wedding. God brings insight out of the darkness of the jail cell. In the deadbeat headlines of a newspaper, hope is written in their margins when before there was not. From the prison cell, freedom is glimpsed when before it was not. From water we are given wine that has now taste which before had not. Do you believe there's more at work? Do you live as though the world is a machine, a blind succession of cause and effect? Have you prayed for God to show you how to seek the sacrament of the present moment? At the heart of this world lies an ecstasy of spiritual intelligence and desire. The entire cosmos is fountaining ever upward in the creation-wide yearning for the goodness of God, and he seeks to draw you into it at your weddings and at your jails. 
your homework is to cultivate a holy expectancy through the factors of anonymity and uncertainty as myriad as they may be. Practice the game with minutes. Fred Frank Laubach is a missionary mystic and literacy advocate who developed this spiritual practice. See how many minutes a day you can become conscious of God's presence. Start with seconds if minutes is too much. It's fine, but whatever it is, even if it's one second a month, the point is to count them. When you make your daily walk up the street to work, slow down, walk more slowly, and look around for once. When you park your car before jumping out and just going, breathe deeply before getting out and wait. As your child falls asleep, close your eyes and listen. When you're in a public space, tarry a little while and wait, attentive and responsive. At the end of your day, reflect on your times of receptivity and on your times of preoccupation. Do this and email me your notable experiences. mlewis at christcathedral.org I am quite serious. I want to see the signs that you see. For you are to look for signs of God, and you are to be one, one of God's goodness and manifold mercy, interpreting the semiotics of God's grace to a world in need, semiconducting, pointing even through the factors of uncertainty that we might see the signs and be the signs and do the good works he has prepared for us to walk in. believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of the one being.
prayers of the people are form five, found on page 389 of the Book of Common Prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming. We pray to you, O Lord. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, for John, Bishop of Tennessee, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember and pray for the United Church of Bangladesh the Most Reverend Paul Shashir Sarkar, Moderator, Church of Bangladesh, and Bishop of Dhaka. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we remember Church of the Holy Trinity, Nashville, for the mission of the church, and that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of re respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord we commend to your gracious care and keeping the men and women of the armed forces, especially Shona, Heath, Chris, Toby, Lewis, Doug, Andy, James, Bradley, and we pray for Will, serving in Gambia as a member of the Peace Corps, at home and abroad, and all those who suffer because of civil strife, that war may end and peace be established. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord. For those in positions of public trust, especially Donald, President of the United States, Bill, Governor of Tennessee, and David, Mayor of Nashville, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord For all who live and work in this community, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord for a blessing upon all human labor and for the right to use the riches of creation that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, especially Catherine, Wes, Susan, Avalie, Thomas, Donna, Jacoba, Stuart, Frank, Michael, Randy, Ellen, Clay, Jeff, Izzy, Doris, Jean, Mark, Christina, and those known to us in the silence of our hearts. For refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord. For this congregation, for those who are present and for those who are absent, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health, and especially for the birth of Daniel Forbes Rossini to Jeff and Carolyn Rossini. We pray to you, O Lord. For the ministry of St. Luke's Community House, we pray to you, O Lord. For the missions of this congregation in Bolivia, Iraq, and Haiti, especially St. Andre's Church 
Hincha, Haiti, and the Reverend Père Noé Bernier, we pray to you, O Lord. For all who have died in the communion of your church, remembering especially Catherine Maddox Quirles, mother of Anne Doolittle, Al Reagan, friend of John Bridges, Kathy Carter, aunt of Allison Bocking, Sam Bartholomew, brother of David Bartholomew, Thomas Wakefield Means, father of Ellen Duncan, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our Lord. Almighty God, who by the hand of Moses, thy servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last, grant that your church, following the example of your prophet Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love and may secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Fair. Peace. Peace to you. Awesome. Peace to you all, and, and welcome, welcome to Christ Church. If you are here today for the first time, or perhaps over the last several weeks have been uh, exploring life at Christ Church, I encourage you to linger a moment after the liturgy at the celebrant. She'll be over here at the, uh, the Archangel, the lectern, a chance for you to learn more about Christ Church. Please know that our, our Journey in Faith group will continue this coming Wednesday at its customary time. And also for, the, for all of us gathered this morning, there's an opportunity for fellowship immediately following the dismissal and organ voluntary this hour in the fellowship hall just across the way. There, there'll be a chance for you to, to uh, get a cup of coffee and make a new friend. So today is the, uh, slightly unusual in our life, as will next Sunday be. It's over these two Sundays that we hold our annual parish meeting. Uh, today, following the 8.30 liturgy, 
the meeting was opened in order to facilitate the placing of vestry nominees for the class of 2022 in nomination. That was done, and then the meeting was recessed so that those present at that moment could move to the polls, which are set up in the parish hall as well. Um, encourage you all before you leave today, if you are an enrolled adult confirmed communicant of Christ Church, age 16 or older, to be sure and linger to, to vote. You need to vote for five on your ballot, and we vote by plurality here, so the five highest vote-getters will be deemed elected following the 12 uh, noon hour next week. That's when the, the votes will be tallied. We'll also have polls open this evening, just after the breaking bread at six hours. For those who, work at, who worship at breaking bread, it'll give them a chance to have an opportunity to vote as well. Those names placed in nomination are those of John Bridges, Elise Duggar, Dave Hansen, Jill Meese, Brooks Smith, Pete Stringer, Andrea Tucker, Ben Turnage, Verena Wilsey, and Ellen Wright. Please remember them in your prayers this week. It's a, it's a time that I, I always, I think, puts a vestry nominee through a, a measure of stress as they walk among those having allowed their names uh, to be placed in nomination among those uh, who will be discerning uh, their role in ministry for the future. Our day today will conclude with breaking bread at 6. I'll be leading worship and Richard Wineland will be reading, leading the music. Just a very brief word about next Sunday. The morning liturgies are consolidated into one. We'll worship at a single hour next week, 9 a.m. Voting polls will be open from, I think it's 8.30 to about 12 or 1. 9 a.m. is worship. Immediately after that is the business session of our annual parish meeting. And then after that, lunch will be served for all who have come and, and have stayed. There will be breaking bread in the evening as well. So next week, just two hours of worship, 9 in the morning and 6 in the evening. I ask your special prayers for Michael Velting today. This past week on Thursday, Michael had hip replacement surgery uh, and is going to be about three weeks in rehab, covering from, recovering from that, not in our, in our common life. Please pray for him and, and a swift and complete uh, recovery. Pray also for, for Joseph Berry. So Joseph Berry has the baton solo, shall we say. He has the, the choir loft, not to himself, obviously accompanied by many grand musicians, but he, he is the one who will orchestrate our musical life over the next uh, several weeks. Please pray for him as well. Uh, Joseph, thank you, brother. Yes, am amen, amen. Here. Indeed, indeed. Uh, other notes for uh, our common life. Our offices will be closed tomorrow uh, on, uh, in observance of MLK Day. Uh, the Wisdom Weekend Retreat is next weekend. Please pray for those going on retreat. And there's still time for you to sign up, sign up if you wish. Pray also for our diocesan convention. They will be meeting in, uh, uh, is it, is it uh, Cookville? Clarksville, thank you. All, all the semester, I've gotten that wrong, it's Clarksville uh, where the, the meeting takes place tomorrow. A, a word about the, uh, uh, the uh, Christchurch Women's Retreat. Please step up and just step right, if you would, to the lectern. That would be great. Very much appreciated. Ladies, please do join us on the mountain at DuBose Conference Center in Monteagle, Tennessee. The dates are February 15th through 17th, President's Day weekend, with featured speaker, our own Reverend Rufus Smith. Yay. Let's go. Here, here. Fellowship, workshops, small groups, coffee and conversation, or quiet time in your room if you prefer. Also offering a hike, jewelry making, intentional meals, leisure time, and of course, lots of fun. Stay one night or two nights or come just for the day. Registration closes this Wednesday, January 23rd. Thank you. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Offer to God the honor due his name. Come into his courts and bring offerings, remembering the words of our Savior who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. 